everyone. Welcome back to the CCO Follow Podcast. Uh, as you know, we're going through this, this whole big idea and topic of eschatology or mm-hmm. the study of end times. And in this episode, we have Kirsten Nelson on and we're excited because we're really going to talk about the like the why behind eschatology. Why yeah. eschatology? Why is it important for us to study, to know? What are some things that are important for us to study mm-hmm. and know? Um, and so, Travis, kind of let's center this this podcast. Let's start it out and kind of center what, what are we really going to be talking about today? We're kind of be looking at the big picture of like why um, this is primarily a conversation. Now, obviously, there's a lot of prophecy in Scripture, and God says that part of the reason it's there is um, to show that He is truly God, that He is uh, that He knows the end from the beginning, and that um, you know. But outside of that, um, you know, the biggest reason that He tells us things that Jesus even said to His disciples, like I tell you in advance so that you may have hope, so that you know mm-hmm. when it happens, that you know, yeah. like I knew this, and this isn't a surprise. I've got this. And um, specifically, we're going to look a little bit into First Thessalonians, where we get, especially those who believe in the rapture, this is one of the, the key you know, sections for that. Yeah. Um, but looking at the big picture of like, why did he write this? Because it's not so that they could... Um, hands off. Yeah it's, yeah. it's not so they could go hands off. It's not so they could try to you know, uncover these really important, you know, quote unquote, important things in eschatology like we often do. I don't think that's bad, but I think sometimes we can get so just in the weeds of all the details of eschatology, we forget yeah. why it was originally written yeah. and the hope it's supposed to bring us. Yeah. So what about for you, Kirsten? What, why are you interested in eschatology? Well, I think the primary reason that I think eschatology is important and what really draws me to it is um, really a discussion on the larger point of scripture. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people come to scripture and they see it as either descriptive or prescriptive, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a description of what happened, what God did, or it's prescriptive. This is how I'm to live my life. Um, But the ultimate and primary purpose of scripture is not to just describe what happened Mm -hmm. or to tell us how to live, but it's to reveal who God is. And so eschatology, I think, almost more than anything else in scripture, really shows us the nature, person, and character of Christ and Mm -hmm. of God, um, the Trinity. And so we get to see God very clearly and how he deals with humanity at the end of all things. And it's one of the most beautiful and powerful parts of scripture when you read eschatology in Old and New Testament. Yeah, I mean, the revelation of Jesus Christ, literally. I mean, sometimes we just say revelation, but it's literally, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, all of scripture. So, okay, so you mentioned uh, Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. Do we have anything that we want to read? from? We have a lot of things we want to read. Let's do it. You ready for this? All right. So, uh, the first section is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who have died and passed away, that you may not be grieved as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Mm -hmm. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And then he continues the chapter talking about how uh, the day of the Lord is going to be coming like a thief in the night, etc. <clears throat> and then um, in the next chapter, First Thessalonians 5, verses 8 through 11, he says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for the a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Hmm. And all throughout First Thessalonians, it's actually, I forgot which pastor said this, but years ago, I remember hearing a pastor say that First Thessalonians is like the the first book he'd point new Christians to. <clears throat> because yeah. um, although, you know, the Gospel of John, usually the classic answer is nice, First Thessalonians dives straight into like, this is what it means to be a Christian. Yeah. He starts off being like, you turn from idols to serve the living God. He talks about 
um, you know, living a holy life. He talks about living a life amongst non-believers, among Christians, like all these different things. And then in this section, in these last two chapters, he's talking about what it means to live in light of Jesus's return Mm -hmm. and to give them hope that he's returning, to Mm -hmm. um, remind them to not um, just kind of sit around because Jesus is returning, to not... um, you know, give up because he's returning, like all these hopeful things surrounding this idea of his returning. And sometimes we hyper-focus on, okay, well, how is the returning happening? And it's like, well, that's fine. That's great. There's a place for that. But it can overshadow the more important message of Paul here, which was he is returning. So how do you live today? And what kind of hope do you live with today? Yeah. Yeah. What are are some thoughts that you have kind of on this whole, uh, what Paul is, is writing to the Thessalonians? Yeah, I think it's, again, just, I like to look at the whole of scripture when we're talking about eschatology, because Old Testament and New Testament have eschatological themes and Mm -hmm. passages and scriptures. And what is being said here in Thessalonians is what was being said in Daniel and Ezekiel Mm -hmm. and um, in the New Testament in both first and second Thessalonians and then Revelation. Um, And even in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, there's a passage in there where Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and warning his disciples. Mm -hmm. And then right after that, he goes into a discussion of the son of man coming. And then right after that, he goes into a series of parables that talks about being prepared, being yeah. ready for the day of the yeah. Lord. And so th- this idea that we are to understand the nature of God, that he is a patient God, and the mm-hmm. end is going to come when the fullness of the people in the kingdom of God are in in his under his wing, right? Yeah. Um, but the other, the flip side of that being, we need to be ready and prepared yeah. because we yeah. don't know when that's going to happen. Yeah. 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 I, I think for me, you know, I, reading through first and second Thessalonians and, and even just really the whole gospel, like I'm trying to put myself in, in those shoes. And I mean, we're all in those shoes. We all want yeah. Jesus to come back. That's mm-hmm. our hope. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, you know, we talk about like the Christian faith as kind of these things that are just a part of it, but we're mm-hmm. not actually looking towards like, no, Jesus is coming back. Yeah, there's a storyline that's part of Exactly. And then yeah. we think about, like, if, if you actually follow that through, that's what es- eschatology is. It's it's Jesus coming back. It's how, you know, we're, we're getting these little tidbits, these glimpses in how that might take yep. place. But what I love about Thessalonians is I think I can relate to them a little bit where it's like, well, wait a minute. If he's coming back, like... They they thought like he would come back. Yeah, and so some right of them just away. literally stopped working. So which they is were why like, well, why? Them. Yeah, why would I? Why would I need to do this? You know, why would I need yeah. to go? go I shouldn't to work need to here? save. I shouldn't need to. You exactly. Know. And I and I I I a part of me like doesn't blame them. Like, oh, I, totally. It's kind of like, yeah, yeah I want to live totally yeah. ready for the Lord to come back too. Yeah. But yeah. I love what Paul is kind of grounding them on. Is like, yeah, he is coming back. We don't know, but he is coming back. We don't know when, but we're like, we have work to do here still. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, this is how we're supposed to be living. This is how we're, what we're supposed to be doing. And I think it's just such an encouragement, at least for me to, to read that and be like, you know what? This is why I'm working Mm -hmm. because he's coming back. Yeah. You know, there wouldn't be a reason for me to do so otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's just like, um, you know, the, the parable of the talents where it's like the master went away. They didn't know he's going to return. Yep. They just knew they had to work the talents they had until he returned. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes we can have that attitude of like, so focused on well, what are the signs when he returns? It's like, well, maybe you should just keep your head down until he returns. You know, in some ways, keep your head up, like looking for him, sure. but like keep your head down in the sense of like, keep working your talents. Yeah. Like he is going to return and you're going to want to be able to show yourself faithful when he gets here. Yep. That's good. Yeah. So what are some other things, um, like takeaways that we can kind of glean from this passage of scripture? Yeah, I think I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, again, going back to the, the eschatology in throughout all of scripture, when you read old Testament and new Testament, um, books that refer to the end times, 
Um, you're always reading books that were originally uh, addressed to a suffering audience. Yeah. Mm. So Old Testament, you have yeah. parts of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. You're writing; they're writing to the um, Jews in exile, right? Yeah. So these people had watched their families be slaughtered, their homeland taken away from them, their right to worship being denied, mm -hmm. and then they were sent into a, a godless society where they lived for 70 years. And so they were feeling very hopeless. Yeah. So God sent these prophets to tell them the end is going to come yeah, and God yeah. is going to right all of the wrongs. And then yeah. New Testament, the, the, the church in Thessalonica and then the churches um, that Paul or that um, John wrote to in Revelation mm -hmm. were all experiencing intense persecution. Yeah. Yeah. So what better hope do you give somebody who is suffering than the, the return of the son of man? Yeah. God is going to right every wrong. Justice is yeah. going to be perfectly enacted mm -hmm. and you're going to be your short existence here is nothing compared to the eternity that you're going to experience with sinless perfection, all your tears wiped away, the kingdom yeah. of God is established. So it's an incredibly hopeful passage yeah. for any person who has existed long enough to taste suffering. Yeah. 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 I'm, and I'm just, just going to put this out there. I think on the flip side, for someone who is living maybe in today's culture, that hopeful message could seem kind of like ooh, kind of scary like that's yeah. not necessarily <clears throat> so hopeful i mean i'm i'm kind of talking more about like a non-christian kind of worldview mm -hmm. yeah. um because i think a lot of what we read in in here in revelation like that is kind of frightening oh you yeah know, when, there's a god who's going to come back and be like yeah. what'd you do <laughs> and especially yeah. if if you're if if you're uh, i guess idols or or what you love here yeah. is you know worldly and it's not christ because everything else is, is going yeah. away yeah you're that's not a happy or hopeful message yeah but it's so it's so different for the christian who is looking for christ to come back and i think i think it's easy in the american culture that we live in to mm, kind of feel like a mourning over our comfort here yeah yeah well i mean you know uh it's no different than like what jesus with this parable of like the the building your house on the rock or the sand mm. and um you know when you look at all the things we try to build our houses on you know, our metaphorical lives on mm -hmm. and um like the sand it's like okay well you have you know family or friends or work or good yeah. grades or what have you and it's like okay well what if you get a bad grade if you get fired from your job what if your spouse leaves you yeah. what if you're you know something happens all these different things that can happen during your life and it's like well this is the same sinking sand it's a shifting sand yeah. your house is going to fall but the ultimate you know torrential downpour to use jesus's example of you know the the rain coming is death and it's like you know it's very possible you could live your entire life never get fired from your job live your entire life and never a financial yeah. issue live your entire life never have a health issue die. live your live your entire life and not have any of these things your you know manufactured house on shifting sands may never be revealed until death yep. yeah. but at that point None of those things, none of those things are a foundation that your, your eternal house can ever be built on. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I like this because it is, I think, I think so often we do get caught up in the weeds of like, when is he coming? How is he coming? What's mm -hmm. this going to look like? When the reality is this is a hopeful message is to yeah. encourage us to actually continue to yeah. pursue him and continue to do the work. What, what sort of, well, I heard of a book. I heard of a book recently. I need to look it up, but supposedly it was called something like 88 Reasons Jesus is going to return in 1988." And somewhere in the book, and I, oh I have to gosh. fact check this, but the person was who was commenting on it was like, "Yeah, um, you know," he said somewhere in the book, "It's like, well, we can't know the day or hour, but we know the weekend that." Oh <laughs> my return. gosh! And this just made me think of that. But That's it silly. is it is amazing how hyper focused we can get yeah. on certain details, and it's fine if you want to. I think the I think Scripture has. I think God has revealed a lot for us to look yeah. into for those purposes but not so that we can overshadow the most important part. And it's just like almost anything yeah. in scripture. There's a lot God has said that is meant to be studied, mm. that is meant to be revealed and, and meant for us to look into, but not at the detriment and the loss of the main point. Yeah, that's good. Because I, I was going to say, like, what what are some dangers in that? But I think you just hit the nail on the head because you missed the whole big picture. Yeah, you, so, it's kind of like uh, seminaries... Um, at least used to, I don't know of a recent staff, but seminaries used to put out, uh, and, and Bible theology, like uh, doctorates used to put out more atheists than Christians mm -hmm. because they became wow. so ingrained in just studying 
they lost their faith in the process. And um, we can be go, become so ingrained in studying fine details mm. that we we miss yeah. Jesus in it and we, we lose our hope in it. I mean, Paul was literally none. I doubt any of the Thessalonians took that passage and they're like, so this means, do you think when he says cloud, it means we'll be caught up in his glory? Or do you think it means we'll actually be and yet, physically that's risen what up? We do. And you know, I, I, whether or not that's wrong, I, I don't, you know, that's fine. Like yeah. d- discuss that, but don't miss the big picture yeah. that he was talking to people who were suffering. Like you were saying, Kirsten, people yeah. who were losing loved ones and they were saying, is this it? And Paul's saying, no, it's not. Yeah. Like that's the important part. Yeah. Like do not miss that. Well, that's an important key. You know, how, how we study and how we're keeping us kind of centered on the big point Mm. is an important thing. I'm curious for you, Kirsten, how did you pick up studying eschatology and what were some maybe pitfalls or things you had to learn from in just kind of centering yourself on the big picture? Yeah, so my interest in eschatology um, wasn't peaked when I first started studying scripture. I actually would avoid the like Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation. That's fair. Because, I mean, it's terribly confusing. Yeah. And unless yeah. you're understanding the the key in scripture of in, uh, scripture interpreting scripture and Old mm-hmm. Testament symbolism influencing New Testament mm. symbolism, all of that yeah. nitty gritty, that really does take some intentional effort to understand. Because at a cursory reading, nobody's going to understand it yeah, unless they have somebody yeah. interpreting for them by the grace of God and the spirit. Um, but it actually, eschatology didn't really take on a personal meaning for me until um, I had my first son and mm-hmm. about six months postpartum, I went through a very difficult season where my body just stopped working as it should. And I was really plunged into a season of intense physical suffering. And during that time I was listening to, um, one of like maybe the second time I had listened to a study on revelation Mm -hmm. and I didn't really care about the first time I had listened to the study on revelation, but the second time, because I was in the midst of suffering, it meant everything. And it was a year long study and it was about a year long season of suffering for me. And so during that time, I just, my eyes were open to God in ways that I had never really understood before. And I had never really longed for heaven before Mm. that time. Like I had never really experienced physical suffering where I was aware of the fact I was going to die someday. Mm. Like I was still young enough before then that like I thought I was invincible, (laughs) but I had tasted what... The, the fact that I was going to die someday. And yeah. so Revelation and this these Old Testament books of eschatology, they took on a whole new meaning for me. Mm-hmm. And now I actually, Revelation is one of my favorite books of the Bible, not just because like I can understand some of the things a little bit better and the symbolism and the numerology and all of that, but because I see God so much more clearly in that than I used mm-hmm. to. And I couldn't understand what he was trying to teach me before. And now I see like, it's really just about who is Jesus, like looking in his face, understanding who he is, how he works, how he operates. Yeah. And it, it draws me to the study of the end times more. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's important thing, honestly, with most, with almost all of scripture or let's just say all scripture just for ease. Um, you know, we're going through Genesis through young adults right now. And, um, it's easy in, in books like Genesis to be like, Oh, this is the story of Adam. This is the story of Abraham. This is the story of Isaac. And, um, throughout it, we're taking the kind of, um, direction of like origins and origin stories. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, this is the origin of, you know, mankind, but this is how God interacted with mankind. This is the origin Mm -hmm. of Abraham. This is how this God's promises to Abraham's is the origin of, you know, Isaac and Esau. And this is God's promises to them and how God interacted with them. And the focus of like, yes, we learn about these people, but more importantly, we learn about how God interacted with these people and we learn about God because of how he interacted with these people. And I think all of scripture, you can, lose a sight of God in the midst of the people God is interacting with. Cause we focus on the people we can relate to instead of the God who is trying to say like, this is how I interact with people. This is what I've done. This is what I'm doing. This is how I, yeah. this is who I am. Yeah. And this, this topic eschatology, I think almost more than any other topic has become so man focused. And mm-hmm. you can see that oh, yeah, sure. by the fact that there are ministries and books and dollars rolling in and followings of individuals Mm -hmm. who are leading people astray and Mm -hmm. they're using this very confusing uh, topic in the bible to Mm -hmm. garner uh, to garner a following so that they can feel superior in their knowledge god gave me a special revelation Mm -hmm. well if the bible isn't for everybody who reads it then 
it's useless to us, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So we like to follow people who pretend that they have a special understanding and knowledge because we are ignorant of the facts of eschatology. Mm-hmm. But these people are leading people away from the larger point, which is again, yeah, to reveal God and who yeah. he is and to draw people closer to him. So if you're is so in the weeds and you're so focused on the locust being Black Hawk helicopters and R- Russia and China and all of these figures that you're reading into scripture, which may be there, but if that's your primary focus, you're mm-hmm. missing the point. Yeah. Um, and people are capitalizing on that for their own sake. And so we're misusing the word of God for our own interests. And it's, I, I don't think God is pleased with that because yeah. he wants people to see him more clearly. And, and on top of that, you know, I, like, again, going back to the first that's that's what, I can't even say Thessalonians, that right now. okay. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, I think about like all those people who are so just, it's it's almost like an addiction, looks yeah. like. And and it's like so sad because, yeah, all that might come to pass. Sure. But, you know, over history, you know, I'm sure all these different empires and kingdoms and, you know, they might have thought the same thing and they just, failed and and now it's a a new empire new kingdom and so i think about you know a lot of the people you know i a lot of my friends and and family kind of are talking especially now with what's happening in in, Mm -hmm. you know the world and the u.s and stuff Mm -hmm. they're like oh the end you know it's coming and all these things are gonna happen and it's like or this could just fail and something else could take its place and all that time you spent worrying or concerned about this is like all the time you could have spent, you know, being the light and helping mm-hmm. people come yep. to know that hope. Yep. You know, it's like I look at these in in this darker quote unquote times in the times where suffering is more rampant. It's like that's an opportunity to either worry or get super involved in something that may or may not happen, or yeah. it's a time to look at the bigger picture and to take hope in that and mm-hmm. to show other people that hope. That's yeah. what I think about. Yeah. Well, it's like I've said about um, our time with COVID. One of the things I think was really beneficial from it was that um, it started polarizing people politically. And I saw a lot of Christians go through this phase of getting super hyper political until it kind of broke them. And they were just like, okay, none of this matters. Like I care about the kingdom of God. Mm. And yep. so many people who I knew who were way political get even further during the time, but it pushed them to this point where they were just like, okay, it's not like I just don't think politics are important anymore, but I'm certainly like pro kingdom of God first. I'm so done. Like this is just, this yeah. is over. Yeah. And that was one of the most beautiful things I think that came out of COVID was just that realization for so many Christians, including myself, like during it was just like, it was easy to get caught up in stuff until it yeah. got so ugly that you're just like wait a second like this isn't what we're supposed to be about yeah and um you know thinking of like stuff that you read in revelation you know i think there's nothing wrong with being like okay so there's a um you know an antichrist trinity that we see in revelation you know there's the, there's the three part and it reflects the bigger trinity the times people are so focused on the the main the uh the antichrist trinity that they forget it's like oh yeah this is just a broken version this is mm-hmm. a distorted version of this one let's focus on this one or you have um even the churches sometimes we get so focused on like the the churches and what jesus said to them and it's like oh well you know this is really important. Like they represent these people and they do these. And it's like, yes, Jesus point to all of them was turn to me. Yeah. Like we should turn to Jesus. And yeah. if you relate heavily to one of them, well, great. You have a very particular action steps to turn back to yeah. Jesus. Like, you know, we get so focused on these, these, uh, details that are not Jesus when really they're like you were saying, like they're meant to point us to be like, Oh, this is broken. Jesus is not. Yeah. This is going to come, but Jesus will come, yeah. you know, greater than this will happen, but Jesus will thwart it. And focusing on the, the, but God part of each of those statements is the, the most important part. And it's also the most peace filling part. Yeah. Right? You know, the part that gives I, you hope. I, I'm kind of thinking of, of your, you know, having that year of, of suffering. I'm sure in that year, kind of what you're saying is like, knowing more of who God is yep. was the com- most comforting thing you could possibly have. Yeah. And it's so easy to get caught up in like giving ourselves the comfort, but it's, it's not, it, that comfort is nothing. It's, it's mm-hmm. torn away in seconds. Whereas knowing who God is and knowing what's to come and, and his, the hope that we have in him is like, wow, that is actually what gives me peace. 
So we talked a lot about pitfalls of studying maybe in a different in a in the wrong mindset and knowing the right mindset now how can we start exploring and studying eschatology in a healthy way like what are some good what are some tips that you have maybe that you have travis i am someone who is going to be taking a lot of notes because i i'm i don't i haven't studied this much (laughs) and uh so yeah i'm curious I think it's important when you're starting to, I don't know who said this um, a while ago, but it's always stuck in my head that the main things are going to be the plain things. Okay. Hmm. So it's going to be tempting when you get into studying eschatology to you're going to learn very quickly that a lot of solid, (laughs) that a lot of solid believers disagree on a lot of different points in this, in this topic. Okay. And so I'm usually right. Yeah. (laughs) I'm actually right. No, I'm just kidding. But the point is that when you're reading, do it without commentary first and focus on Mm. the main things or the plain things, the things Mm -hmm. that are most obvious are going to be the main points that God wants to draw Mm. out for you. And as you're doing more study, I suggest that you look at a lot of different commentaries, be prayerful about how you read those commentaries and, and check them with scripture. Like Mm -hmm. don't be tempted to read a book about eschatology by a man who is a millennial versus post millennial or whatever. Read the scripture first, immerse yeah. yourself in the scripture first. Don't read the commentary. Just read, understand what you can, and then check the commentary when after you've done that enough to get mm-hmm. the main points so that you're not so caught up in the weeds and you're mm. not becoming a follower of one particular thought pattern before you've looked at the whole picture. That's yeah. That would be my um, words of wisdom when you're just starting out reading uh, these books. Yeah, that's yeah. good. I think we said this with um, with Tony, but I'll just say it again because I think it's a really good way of doing it is make sure you're, you read the whole thing like you were saying and I would even read the whole thing and then read it again but write a like bullet point of like mm-hmm. these were like three things that happened in this chapter mm-hmm. so yeah. that you can have just kind of your own Create it and not not necessarily like you're saying like focus on the things that are really clear the things that aren't clear don't try to interpret them in this step but just be yeah. like there was a dragon in this chapter and and the dragon came about in this chapter and this came about in this chapter just so that you have, because the reality is, is that um, so much of it is going to be referenced um, again and again at different points. Like you'll have stuff later that references earlier things and just having an idea of like, okay, these things happened. Um, And then I guess before, um, before going to a commentator, the other thing I do is just do a quick Google Google search. I know it sounds dangerous, but quick Google (laughs) search of like, where in the Bible are there eschatology verses? And then go and read those chapters. So it will probably point you to a few chapters in Daniel. It will point you to stuff like the Thessalonians passage. And just read those entire chapters as well and do the same thing where it's like yeah. bullet points of like, okay, this happened. No idea what it is, but this happened. That way, when you start reading commentators, mm-hmm. uh, commentators, commentaries from commentators. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's uh, like Thess- Thessalonians. <laughs> it's like that. Yeah. Um, you You have this like, you know, framework of like, okay, these are the passages. When they reference it, I know what they're talking about. It's not going to be like dragon what? Or, you know, stars yeah. what? Um, there's a dragon chasing a woman. What is happening? Like, you're yeah. aware of like, oh, that was this chapter and this is not that insane. Like, there's, you know, and um, I think that really helps. And That's the other a thing good I, point. Yeah. That's a good point, yeah. The other thing I say about commentators is that personally, um, regarding end times things, I prefer the commentators who don't, only commentate on end times things. Um, I think that there's sure. a danger. Oh, I yeah. think there's a danger when people become experts just in end times. I've seen a trend where when yeah. that becomes their only thing, they <clears throat> are blind to the rest of scripture and how it is, how it's supposed to help interpret right. end times. Right. And so um, yeah. the weirdest things I ever heard from end times uh, people and the the most off base in my opinion things have been from people who that's like their thing. Hmm. And um, so f- go to commentators who have other commentaries on other subjects. They clearly yeah. have a well-rounded view of scripture. Yeah. They're not only looking at this um, cause that's dangerous. Yeah. Well, and I love, I like what you guys are saying because it, when you, I never heard that before where the, what is it? The plain things. Yeah. Or the main things. The main that's things. a good one. That's yeah. a good one. Because rhymed. It, yeah, I am. <laughs> I, I am so tempted to to speculate on oh it's the fun it's so much things. fun yeah. yeah but you're right it is it's it's the plain things that are the main things yeah. I, I like that a lot yeah 
So, okay, so let's just say someone who is listening or someone like me who's like, okay, I want to get into eschatology. I'm hearing, you know, this is kind of how we're, I'm supposed to study. What would you say to them just in their starting off their journey? Or maybe there's someone who is continuing their journey. What would you have to say to them? Anything? Have fun? Yeah. <laughs> if you stop having fun, get off the ride. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I think we said last time we do have Joel Dover coming later this month and he has a very particular view. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's a dispensationalist and, um, and stuff like that. So, you know, understand that that is the general view of our church. It's not the view of every person in our church, yeah. um, nor does it need to be, um, in my opinion. Um, I think what's important is that I think he does, I think he will do a very good breakdown as like a basis of like, here's a good foundation for, um, for this view. Mm. Um, so hopefully you can, you know, hear this, this podcast yeah. long before then. So you can do your reading beforehand and have a general thing. So as he's talking, you can be like, Oh, okay, this is what's happening. Um, but, uh, but know there's other views out there and don't be afraid to, to look at them, you know, yeah. and, um, and recognize, you know, uh, I've been talking a lot with Jasper. He's going to be gone the next episode, but he's been bringing all these different things to me. And he's like, you know, well, how would you interpret this verse? And I, I'd tell him and he's like, well, that sounds a lot more, that sounds a lot less dis dispensationalist. That sounds a lot more uh, covenant theology. And I'm like, Jasper, don't get caught up in those. Ex yeah, yeah. Like the reality is, is like, I think majority of at least Calvary people, like if you truly break down, like, um, every single thing majority people believe it doesn't perfectly fit into a yep. camp. No. Yeah. And no. um, I don't think it's um, usually good to. Um, I think it's helpful to use those words. It's helpful to know, oh, generally when you say this, you kind of believe sure. this. That's <clears throat> that's helpful for starting yeah. conversations. Um, but don't be afraid to read scripture and be like, it's clearly saying this. Yeah. But I'm but I'm this. That's that's okay. Like mm. follow scripture, not um, uh, yeah, yeah, not necessarily groups and definitions. Follow yep. scripture, that's and good. if and if it does go against maybe what you've thought before, don't just abandon what you thought before. Look yeah. into it more. Yeah, just have that be a, a thing to be like. I want to know what scripture says, yeah. and that's you know, have that be your lifelong pursuit. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I think I would say I would just as a general rule of thumb, just be a really good student of scripture as a whole mm -hmm. because I found that my understanding of uh, the books of eschatology and scripture have been um, richer mm -hmm. and having understanding other parts of scripture so yeah. scripture interprets scripture and yeah. that's your that's your baseline and any commentator or student of scripture who has their own books and understanding that's where everybody starts is you yeah. just know scripture from beginning to end mm -hmm. and when you're reading revelation you're like oh that symbolism mm -hmm. is in this book in the old testament yeah. i wonder what it meant there and like you were alluding to that but the idea that we can't understand scripture apart from other parts of scripture. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a self-contained story. And God did that. It, like he wrote this book for the simplest of individuals. So yeah. it, it's not just for the heady. It's not yeah. just for the super nerdy intellectual types. It's for everybody. And so yeah. God has something for everybody in that, but we won't know that unless we understand yeah. all of scripture. And so. Unless you're focusing on the main points, <clears throat> right? Cause yeah. you could absolutely read scripture focusing on only on those, you know, undefined details yeah. at first glance <clears throat> and get really whack things, get mm -hmm. really unimportant things. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, don't, you know, don't do that. <laughs> That's good. Well, thank you so much, yeah. you guys, for to... having this conversation. It it kind of excites me. I just want to go study scripture and study eschatology, and uh, and at the same time, it is comforting knowing that there's hope. Yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, thank you so much for watching and listening. Uh, we hope that you are continuing to just follow along with us and to join us mm -hmm. as we have these conversations. Uh, Joel Dover coming yep. at the end of this month, if yep. you're watching uh, as this is coming out in July. Yeah. Um, yeah, we look forward to that. And uh, as always, God bless.